for the lay person. <laughs> so uh, Ken has lectured, he, he travels regularly to where he, and his travels as part of his research. I mean, he has such a, a breadth of interest. Um, his interest straddles from uh, psychology, mathematics, science, history, art, um, economics, um, yeah, so many different, uh, and when he lectures on each of those topics, you will, you will think that he is an expert in every one of those fields. So I myself find great pleasure in listening to his lectures, so let me, without further ado, give you Ken Hughes. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm talking today on a very strange subject, uh, and um, uh, it is a subject which is highly topical, unfortunately, uh, in that um, the last year we've seen a huge outpouring of negative emotions around the world, uh, with uh, Brexit in Britain and Trump in America, uh, and God knows what, the Golden Dawn in Greece and all sorts of other strange people all over the world uh, expressing hatred. Uh, I started working on this, however, two years ago uh, when I was interested in uh, what was going on in South Africa. And there were also kind of uh, extraordinary scenes with uh, huge outpourings of emotion. Um, uh, so it's partly a response to current events, uh, and um, it's partly uh, a question of being generally interested in um, theory, the theory of the social sciences in particular, uh, which has been predominantly, uh, until recently, rational man theory, as they call it. Um, uh, this is not a sexist term. The emphasis is on rationality. Uh, and um, the uh, idea is that human behavior is best understood in terms of rational pursuit of goals. Uh, and the goals are uh, generally specified in fairly sort of uh, understandable and concrete uh, ways, uh, and you try and explain why inflation happens, or you explain um, why uh, people in primitive societies practice mother-in-law avoidance uh, by um, uh, some sort of appeal to a story where people are rationally pursuing their goals. Uh, and uh, what has become evident, however, is that uh, in addition to um, these kind of traditional uh, social science analyses in terms of rationality, we also need to bring in the emotions, uh, because the emotions um, are sometimes irrational. We'll come to that uh, qualification about sometimes uh, repeatedly. Uh, because, of course, uh, what has emerged uh, from uh, a whole lot of different work on the subject of the emotions during the course of uh, the last two centuries is that uh, the emotions, too, have a rationality uh, about them, but it's not the rationality of neoclassical economics. So uh, we need to uh, think about emotions. We need to tell stories about uh, people's behavior uh, governed by emotion. But it, these stories, in general, will be different from the kind of stories we use uh, to explain um, kind of things like inflation or mother-in-law avoidance. Um, so uh, here we have it. Um, uh, the uh, contemporary relevance, um, and um, uh, this uh, I took off the internet, uh, uh, a, 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 a confrontation between two pu publications. I think Le Salon uh, uh, ha had this comparison first, uh, and then it was reproduced in the Huffington Post uh, 
uh, with uh, an indignant comment that uh, to juxtapose Hitler and Trump, um, even if they were doing the same thing, uh, namely shouting out hatred, uh, was itself a kind of hate speech. Um, so uh, we are looking at a very contemporary uh, phenomenon, but um, because uh, it's uh, precisely uh, so contemporary and so controversial, I want to move away uh, from uh, these uh, kind of uh, contemporary situations, or rather I will leave it to you in the audience to draw uh, contemporary morals uh, and try and achieve some distance by talking about various uh, societies rather uh, remote from ours and talking about uh, historical eras before the present. Uh, in that way, we are able to <coughs> achieve some sort of distance and objectivity, hopefully. Um, but uh, I'm going to be uh, very conscious of the fact that um, a lot of uh, my motivation for uh, digging up this strange subject uh, has been in order to understand the contemporary world. Uh, so um, I want to uh, move on uh, to talking a bit about um, the uh, history of uh, uh, academic or more general learned reflection on the subject of the emotions. Um, this itself is an interesting topic, although it's not really my topic, but I always think that you get an insight into any subject by uh, looking at the history of what people have thought about it. So uh, I end up teaching things like the history of economic thought uh, in the economics department or uh, teaching the history of law in the law faculty. Uh, I think that you uh, really do get an insight from uh, looking at the history of a subject. So uh, before actually talking about um, the emotions themselves, I'm going to uh, say a bit about uh, how people have approached it uh, over a very long haul, going all the way back to the Greeks. Uh, and today, uh, the emotion which I'm going to focus on is disgust. Uh, partly because there's a wonderful book um, I think people should have received a reading list uh, at the entrance when you came in, you did, uh, which has a list of my major sources on it, uh, but here is William Ian Miller's book, The Anatomy of Disgust, uh, which will uh, occupy the uh, tail end of the lecture. Uh, and um, I just want to say uh, some preliminary words about um, the general treatment of the emotions, uh, which uh, has been, until recently, um, uh, pretty dreadful. The uh, basic uh, truth of the matter is that there's a whole lot of um, kind of prejudice uh, uh, the, uh, which goes all the way back to the Greeks. In fact, the Greeks were really uh, very much responsible for this because uh, they were the people who first drew the line between rationality and irrationality. Uh, and the notion of irrationality um, was, uh, for the Greeks, the unspeakable. Uh, things which were uh, you couldn't even uh, formulate in language. Uh, so, um, and uh, the uh, Pythagorean Brotherhood famously uh, discovered the irrationality of Route 2, but uh, kept it a secret for a hundred years uh, because it undermined the official belief uh, that the world and men were rational. Uh, so uh, there is this um, strong uh, set of ideas about rationality and irrationality and this tendency to identify the emotions uh, as being um, uh, the uh, domain of the irrational, uh, which goes all the way back to the Greeks and it's terribly strong in Greek culture. Uh, one finds that um, when one looks at the historians like uh, Herodotus and Thucydides, uh, they have this terrific admiration of uh, people like Pericles who were known uh, for their icy cold rationality. Uh, it's part of Greek culture to admire people um, who are cold uh, and to be fearful about people who are hot. 
And of course, uh, we immediately have associations about hot-tempered people uh, and, um, and cool reason. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the Greeks. So um, the first people I want to uh, talk about are Aristotle and Plato. Uh, here in this uh, wonderful painting by Raphael, which is in the Vatican, this called the School of Athens, um, uh, Raphael uh, Sanzio, the great painter from Urbino, uh, was lucky enough to be the contemporary of uh, a, a large number of great men. Um, and so uh, uh, this is just, of course, the central pair in the, the famous picture of the School of Athens. Uh, but he got all the famous people of his day to model for him. So Plato on the left here is actually um, uh, a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, the uh, Aristotle on the right is rather less well known. It's an architect. Uh, but um, at the front of the picture, and this is not reproduced, we have Michelangelo. So it's an extraordinary picture, one of the, the great pictures. I always think it kind of sum, uh, su summarizes just in visual form a huge amount of uh, the important ideas of Western civilization, uh, the school of Athens. But uh, I want to draw your attention to the symbolism. That's why I enlarged the two central figures and cut out uh, all the minor people in this great picture. Um, well, perhaps minor people is in inappropriate because, of course, uh, the, the people included in the picture do include Michelangelo and do include Raphael himself. Uh, but uh, concentrating on the two central figures because there's symbolism involved. Uh, and the symbolism is this, uh, that Plato is pointing upwards to the heavens. Uh, whereas Aristotle is pointing downwards to the earth. Uh, and uh, this is very much uh, a meaningful contrast uh, because uh, it was Plato uh, who idealized uh, mathematics and philosophy uh, and uh, held that they were uh, a part of a, uh, a suprasensible uh, realm, the realm of ideas or essences, uh, and that um, the soul uh, of every human being was struggling upwards uh, towards the heavens, towards the ideal, uh, and was um, being dragged down by the dark forces of matter. Uh, the soul was imprisoned in the body, uh, and, um, uh, but the, the true uh, aim of uh, uh, life, or uh, the true aim of the universe, really, was um, the contemplation of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Uh, and that was achieved by ascent heavenwards. Uh, and uh, Plato has, of course, uh, these amazing uh, descriptions uh, in the, the various dialogues uh, of the realm of reason and its contrast with the, uh, the realm of brute matter. Uh, and, of course, the emotions are there to drag you down. Um, he has this uh, uh, wonderful imagery of the charioteer. Uh, and um, the, uh, the wild horses are the emotions which uh, drag you off course. Um, so uh, Plato is very much uh, a representative figure, a, a central figure in uh, the Western tradition, uh, but very much associated with uh, this uh, kind of uh, set of attitudes towards cold reason and the hot emotions, uh, the idea that the emotions are irrational, the idea that they uh, distract you they, uh, from the cool pursuit of uh, truth and beauty. Uh, and Aristotle is very different. Uh, the trouble is, of course, that Aristotle, in some ways, um, has two stories which are not altogether consistent. Uh, on the one hand, um, Aristotle uh, 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 continues to reflect the general Greek idealization of reason. Uh, it's Aristotle who is famously responsible for describing uh, human beings as man, the rational animal. Uh, the rational animal. Uh, 
But on the other hand, uh, there's some wonderful but rather less well-known stuff, which is in Re Aristotle's writings on rhetoric, uh, where um, he looks at the emotions. And you've got to understand that um, politics, which was uh, very much uh, a concern in the Greek uh, city-states uh, because of the, uh, the participation of uh, citizens. Uh, Greek democracy, of course, was uh, not democratic in the modern sense, in that citizens uh, were restricted. Uh, they were males, they were locals, they were people of a certain age, uh, and um, uh, in some cases they were property holders. But uh, the crucial point was that uh, a politics involved more people than just the royal family or the local tyrant, uh, and so a rhetoric, uh, the ability to make speeches uh, on political subjects uh, was an essential accomplishment um, for uh, the uh, citizen of a city-state like Athens. Um, and uh, rhetoric formed an essential part of the curriculum, uh, again, for uh, uh, male citizens. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's not uh, democratic in the modern sense, uh, but it, 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 it does extend the uh, participation. And so rhetoric is an important part of this. And rhetoric already, for the Greeks, uh, often involved um, kind of evoking appropriate emotions in the audience. Uh, it was a question of getting the audience aroused and getting them all uh, steamed up behind some particular proposal, like a declaration of war um, or a, uh, a kind of an expedition to found a colony in some other part of the Mediterranean, uh, or the trial of individual. One thinks of the trial of Socrates, the most famous of all Athenian trials. Um, rhetoric was important. And rhetoric often involved an appeal to the emotions. So Aristotle, uh, in his uh, rhetoric, is actually kind of wonderful. Uh, in some ways, he's ahead of us. Uh, he has more subtle ideas about uh, the interaction of the emotions than you will find in most of today's psychologists. Uh, so um, Aristotle is, uh, well, uh, two-faced. On the one side, he's responsible for all the cliches about man, the rational animal. Uh, and on the other side, uh, he has this uh, considerable and deep insight uh, into the psychology of the emotions, uh, which, uh, as I said, I, uh, I'm one of the people who take the view that Aristotle is ahead of us. Uh, he has more insight than is currently available in most psychology and certainly in uh, most philosophy. So uh, we will come back to Aristotle from time to time. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I uh, am sorry that I'm not actually able to say a bit more about uh, the revolution which was brought about by Christianity, because uh, um, one's come recently also to think that uh, Christianization, although it took a lot from the Greeks, inclu including the uh, kind of idea of the body as a prison uh, holding the soul, um, uh, Christianity did make a big difference, in particular uh, in terms of ideas of equality. Uh, women uh, were not treated exactly the same as men. You will remember that St. Paul uh, tells women that they should go and cover their heads when they prophesy. Uh, but um, uh, they were regarded as having souls uh, and um, being therefore uh, important for uh, uh, receiving Christian teaching and Christian doctrine. Um, and similarly, Christianity reached out uh, to a whole lot of other people who had tended to be um, uh, marginalized uh, in uh, classical societies. Uh, one thinks of younger sons, one thinks of um, slaves, one thinks of servants, 
uh, all these people were potential Christian converts, uh, and therefore Christianity made a big difference to the uh, evolution of ideas of equality. But I can't really say much about that in this context because I'm I wanting to concentrate on the emotions. Uh, and the truth of the matter is that until um, the Renaissance, uh, the emotions were generally regarded uh, with platonic contempt. Uh, they were generally uh, regarded uh, negatively. Uh, and it's one of the extraordinary things about the Renaissance. Uh, the word, of course, means rebirth. Uh, and the sort of cliche way of thinking about the Renaissance is the rebirth of classical culture. But what actually happened, in particular in Italy uh, during the Renaissance, um, was uh, the revival of interest in the classical culture, uh, which wasn't always a, a kind of um, mimetic uh, uh, or imitative uh, interest. Uh, there was a critical attitude developed towards the classics. Um, and, uh, and, and this is absolutely sort of crucial because um, it's, uh, in some sense, the origin of a whole lot of uh, modern uh, enlightenment ideas, uh, the idea that um, one can be liberated through education. Uh, the idea uh, that one should take responsibility for oneself uh, and not uh, kind of just uh, blame things on astrology, um, which was the main form of determinism in those days. Uh, and um, uh, the Renaissance uh, really is a, is a crucial phase, and I've come to realize this more and more. And so the next person I want to mention is somebody who you've probably never heard of, um, Leonardo Bruni, uh, who is uh, one of the great uh, Florentine historians uh, and uh, was um, a, a major figure in uh, Florentine politics, uh, having had this uh, wonderful classical education uh, which had been uh, revived uh, by a number of people in the preceding generations before him, uh, he uh, took the view that oratory was uh, a central part of the arts uh, and should be mastered by every uh, kind of uh, cultivated person. Um, and so uh, his job during his lifetime, before he became the official Florentine historian, was as public orator. Uh, and, he had, and he's buried in a rather magnificent tomb uh, in Santa Maria Novella. Uh, and um, uh, he's a very important figure. Uh, here you'll see um, these are mosaics from Florence. On the right-hand side, there's a visual pun, uh, Bruni's History of Florence, uh, which is an illuminated book, illuminates Florence. The book is shown as uh, shining out towards the city. Now, the crucial point made by uh, Bruni, uh, and, and here he is a swing figure, um, was that he was the first person to speak up in defense of the emotions. The first person I can find. Uh, of course, uh, one realizes that there may well be, <coughs> as there often are, obscure medieval predecessors. But um, uh, Bruni is the first person um, to speak up in defense of the emotions. Um, and he does so on more than one occasion. But the most memorable uh, uh, occasion which he does speak up is when he says, um, uh, anger makes us brave. Uh, and courage, of course, uh, is one of the key virtues for citizens, uh, even if they are citizens of uh, a medieval uh, city uh, republic like Florence, rather than an ancient city-state. Um, so anger makes us brave, uh, the first uh, modern defense of the emotions. Uh, and um, it, and it, it, it goes on from there. Uh, this, uh, again, tends to be forgotten, or has been forgotten until recently. The next person I've got is the great Scottish philosopher David Hume. Uh, 
uh, right in the heart of the 18th century. Uh, and you would imagine that um, the 18th century, being the age of the Enlightenment, uh, would be all against the passions, but this is not so at all. Uh, on the contrary, uh, one of the famous quotes from Hume is this, man is and ought to be the slave of the passions. Uh, and this is partly because uh, of David Hume uh, having an elaborate uh, kind of psychology and an elaborate kind of philosophy uh, in terms of which reasons are not sufficient to motivate people. Uh, he a kind of uh, uh, has various strange examples uh, where he's, uh, he kind of says, what reason is there for me to prefer um, the uh, tickling of my little finger um, to the uh, destruction of the inhabitants of the Americas. These two uh, events are uh, uh, totally unrelated and, and it might be more sensible for him to uh, prefer to be free of tickling than uh, even if it means the destruction of all the people in America. Uh, so, um, he, uh, uh, so reasons are not motivating for Hume. Uh, what is motivating is passion. Uh, and, um, uh, and so there's this extraordinary thing right in the heart of the 18th century. And Hume is not alone. Uh, of course, his great friend, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, was one of the uh, main uh, spokesmen for passion uh, in the 18th century. Found, uh, founding father of Romanticism in many ways, Rousseau. Uh, but it goes back even earlier, in the generation before. There's an interesting generation in the 1720s, uh, and, uh, which, uh, again, is a, an extraordinary story, which I will probably come back to. Um, the handkerchief uh, was a late medieval invention, uh, and were very rare. Uh, partly because the first handkerchiefs were silk, and silk was extremely valuable and had to be imported from Asia. Uh, Erasmus, the great humanist scholar, uh, in his will um, lists the, uh, very proudly the fact that he has uh, no less than 25 handkerchiefs. Uh, that shows he's a, a, a real top achiever. Uh, and, um, uh, but the, uh, a, 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 and you see, of course, that the bulk of the population didn't, because the, bo the books on table manners uh, as late as, uh, the, as, 17, uh, uh, as 1700 are saying things like, uh, people should not wipe their noses on the tablecloth. Uh, and... Um, uh, the, uh, you know, it is disgusting to wipe your nose on the tablecloth. Um, so, uh, the, uh, but in the 1720s, uh, the fashionable people in Paris are instructed to always carry two handkerchiefs, one for blowing the nose and the other uh, for mopping the brow or uh, dealing with the situation when uh, people want to cry. Crying is legitimate. Uh, it's not something which needs to be su uh, suppressed. And in fact, by the end of the 18th century, uh, somebody who cried a lot was regarded as having a superior sensibility. Uh, and you get this in Jane Austen, uh, in, and, and, and more, actually, of course, because that wonderful novel she wrote as a teenager, Love and Friendship, uh, one of the characters, uh, Marianne, um, is, ad, is described as being as good at fainting as she is bad at spelling. So, uh, sensibility, it came in uh, with the age of the Enlightenment, uh, but the emotions were uh, kind of given a boost in the 19th century by a surprising follower of Hume, who was no less than um, Charles Darwin. Um, and uh, here's a, a, a nice picture uh, at the back, Darwin's drawing of the, the finches, which are now named after him, the Darwin finches, which were one of his main early puzzles, which led to evolution. Uh, and um, uh, in uh, partial tribute to uh, my friend and colleague Tim Crow, I have emphasized the birds in Darwin's work. Um, 
But Darwin uh, wrote at the end of his life uh, a remarkable book. It's one of my favorite Darwin books. Um, it's called uh, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Uh, and um, it's uh, an extraordinary book in many, many ways. Uh, the first edition came out uh, just, I think, about a year before his death, and he was revising the second edition when he died. And the second edition, which is the copy I have here, was completed by his son based on notes which he left at his death. Now, the, the book is extraordinary because, of course, it's partly an argument about evolution, about how animals and man share this common inheritance of the emotions, but it's also um, a, uh, a defense of Hume's view that the emotions are motivating. Uh, and, it's a, uh, and, it's in some, and, and many of the discussions are very modern. Some of them are not, but uh, many of them are. Um, and uh, so there are whole chapters on things like suffering and weeping, um, low spirits, anxiety, grief, dejection, and despair, joy, high spirits, love, tender feelings, devotion, <coughs> reflection, meditation, um, ill temper, hatred and anger, um, disdain, contempt, and then the section I'm interested in today, disgust. Because Darwin, uh, in an amazingly prescient discussion, has five pages devoted to disgust, uh, which I will read you in a moment. Um, now, uh, the point, uh, I just wanted to stop here and make the point that uh, we've had a revival of interest in uh, evolution among psychologists in the last uh, 25 years, and so you will now get textbooks with titles like An Introduction to Evolutionary Psychology. I went and looked at a, a, a good textbook uh, while preparing this lecture and was horrified to see that the modern Darwinians devote a half a page to disgust, uh, whereas Darwin himself devoted five pages. Uh, so, uh, once again, we find that uh, the great thinkers of the past are ahead of us. Uh, we've still got to catch up with them, uh, and we've, here we've got to catch up with Darwin. So, just let me read you the first paragraph of what Darwin says about disgust, because it provides a very good uh, example of the kind of analysis which uh, evolutionary approaches uh, imply. The, the sort of simplest possible case is thinking about um, the need of animals to uh, escape from danger. Uh, so when they encounter a predator, they encounter hostility. Uh, they must be ready uh, to um, flee. Uh, and, and so many animals have the so-called fight or flight response, uh, which usually involves kind of pumping adrenaline into the body. Uh, and, and that, of course, is a very good example of how um, uh, you get this uh, combination of physiology uh, and intentionality. Uh, the emotion has got an object. It's uh, the, uh, the thing which is creating fear. Uh, but um, it, uh, it, the emotion does at the same time as uh, putting the wind up, uh, give you the means of escape by preparing the body uh, to run or to fight. Uh, and that's the sort of clearest, simplest example. Disgust is more complicated. It's not obvious um, what uh, evolutionary uh, benefits are conferred by uh, developing a faculty of disgust. Um, so, uh, and it's still controversial. There are still be several theories, which I will come to uh, before the end of the lecture. Um, but uh, the, um, let me just read you what Darwin says about disgust. The term disgust, uh, in its simplest sense, means something offensive to the taste. Um, it is curious how readily this feeling is excited by anything unusual in the appearance odor or nature of our food. In Tierra del Fuego, a native touched with his finger some cold preserved meat which I was eating at one bivouac and plainly showed utter disgust at its softness. Um, while I felt utter disgust at my food being touched by a naked savage. <laughs> 
uh, though his hands did not appear dirty. Uh, a, 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 a smear of soup on a man's beard looks disgusting, uh, though there is, of course, nothing disgusting in the soup itself. Um, I presume that this follows from the strong association in our minds between the sight of food, however circumstanced, and the idea of eating it. So he suggests that the reason why you find um, a, a food, a soup smeared on the beer disgusting is because it immediately evokes the association of uh, eating a beard. Well, that I think is a little far-fetched. But, uh, but, but that's Darwin's analysis, that uh, it, uh, the disgust is ultimately related to food. Uh, and most of the modern Darwinian analyses uh, follow this. Uh, the idea is that um, animals which have a built-in um, response um, to contaminated food are obviously going to do much better than animals which, who don't. Uh, so there's an evolutionary advantage uh, in being disgusted by contaminated food uh, or poisonous food. And, and probably the strongest anti-poison response uh, is the automatic response which many of us have uh, to things which are uh, extremely uh, bitter. Uh, or, or, uh, you know, a kind of uh, a taste horrible in other ways. Um, that's uh, probably the, the sort of core notion underlying disgust. But as we'll see in a moment, um, uh, we've got to allow for uh, kind of cultural factors and developments um, that the very fact, of course, that uh, uh, disgust uh, and that, uh, that gust uh, part of the word is from taste. One thinks of the Spanish uh, uh, me gusta, uh, what, I, what I like. Um, uh, one um, uh, one realises that um, uh, uh, food may be the start of it, but uh, there's a lot more to disgust than just being protected against eating decaying food. There's, a, there's been a kind of cultural elaboration on a, a central biological core. Uh, and this is true of most of the emotions, and it's an important factor which we're going to need to take into account. Now, I want to jump uh, to the uh, late 20th century. Uh, two American academics who led the way in pioneering the modern study of the emotions. Uh, one on the left was the philosopher Robert Solomons, who wrote this book, The Passions, uh, in 1972, I think. Um, and uh, the subtitle is Emotions and the Meaning of Life. Uh, and it was a book uh, written uh, partly in protest against the prevailing philosophy of the time, uh, which was either uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world analytic philosophy, which tended to dismiss uh, kind of all uh, sorts of evaluation, including evaluative emotions, uh, the hooray and boo uh, theory of uh, evaluation uh, or values, as it was sometimes called, um, or existentialism, which is the predominant philosophy on the continent of Europe, uh, and of course uh, spread also to the Anglo-Saxon world, although I think it was stronger in America than it was in Britain. Uh, now, existentialism tended to want to say that life was meaningless uh, and, um, uh, and that uh, meaning had to be imparted to life by conscious uh, decisions. Uh, you would uh, decide and, uh, that you were going to become a Catholic or a communist uh, or take some other dramatic uh, decision somewhere early on in your life, and then you had to stick to that because uh, that was the only kind of authenticity which existentialism allowed. Uh, and um, uh, so this, uh, the existential leap, the leap of faith, uh, the assumption that one would, um, uh, that a, a normal part of life was making these leaps of faith, that was the existentialist view of the world, and it was a view uh, where life was intrinsically meaningless, but was given meaning by these acts of faith. Uh, 
Uh, whereas uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, the notion of the meaning of life was just regarded as a kind of verbal mistake. It was people who didn't understand the meaning of meaning. Uh, and um, you know, you could talk about the meaning of a sentence, but talking about the meaning of life was uh, a, a kind of um, a nonsense phrase. Um, so, uh, reacting against this, Robert Solomon wrote this book, The Passions, uh, which is a defense of um, life as meaningful and a passionate life as being particularly meaningful. Uh, and the argument is that uh, love, uh, love of persons and the joy uh, encountered in the arts, the appreciation of music, the appreciation of beautiful, beautiful paintings, these are the great things uh, which make life meaningful. Uh, and then there are various other kinds of things. There's achievement and there are a whole long list of other things. Um, the uh, the emotion, uh, and the, the crucial point was this. He disputed the irrationality of emotion, saying that emotions are, in some important sense, evaluative judgments. We, we know at once that there are positive emotions and negative emotions, and this expresses some sort of approval and some sort of disapproval. Uh, and so they're evaluative judgments, um, and uh, they are also uh, related to uh, social interests and human interests. Uh, and um, uh, this is uh, the important thing about them. And they make life meaningful. A life uh, which was um, uh, one where one uh, solely uh, depended on a simple uh, kind of uh, bodily uh, pleasures would probably be a pretty meaningless life. The, uh, the, nowadays, people talk about, philosophers talk about being plugged into an experience machine, uh, which could uh, kind of, you know, kind of give you, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of maintain your bodily temperature and give you uh, sort of ma mild uh, 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 sort of caresses and um, uh, keep the uh, outer, uh, outer surface. Uh, well, but not challenging. Uh, this need for a challenge is also a part of uh, what makes life uh, meaningful. So Solomon was a pioneer, and the book is still worth reading even today. Um, but he's been followed by a whole lot of other people, in particular, followed by a whole lot of psychologists. And the person on the right, Paul Rosen, uh, is the person who is most famous uh, for his work on the experimental study of disgust. Uh, he uh, inv devised a large number of uh, experiments, some of which are truly appalling. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the part of his theory uh, is uh, that a, a disgust develops during the course of the life cycle uh, particularly in small children um, as they are potty trained. Uh, that uh, finding poo disgusting uh, is an important part of growing up. Uh, and, um, uh, and so uh, he tests this uh, by uh, kind of um, uh, uh, providing uh, laboratory subjects with um, various tasks involving um, uh, chocolate, which has been disguised to look like feces. Uh, very ingenious, but in some cases rather horrible experiments. Um, and uh, he has a long list of the things which uh, are kind of um, are regarded as disgusting. Uh, one of the top performers is worms. Uh, eating worms is one of the most horrible things, uh, which people, uh, one of the most disgusting things which most people can imagine. Uh, and he points out uh, that um, uh, you can put a, a single worm in a bowl of cherries, and that will completely spoil the bowl, whereas putting a single cherry in a bowl of worms will have no effect. <laughs> so. Uh, various ingenious experiments and, uh, and a theory, which is a theory uh, basically of Darwinian kind uh, that the disgust mechanisms are evolved uh, 
uh, and uh, to protect humans, particularly against poison and against uh, rotting food, as Darwin foresaw, uh, but uh, they have been uh, elaborated on and uh, developed by human cultures. And so, of course, we find this uh, thing which the cultural relativists uh, love emphasizing that uh, different uh, people around the world uh, have different concepts uh, of uh, what is disgusting uh, when it comes to cultural matters. Uh, the, there's a huge lot of disgust uh, universally centered on sex, but only the people from Tahiti, uh, I think it's the people from Tahiti, I didn't check this, uh, but I may have got the island wrong, it's somewhere in Polynesia, uh, only the people from Tahiti find feet disgusting and, and want feet covered up all the time. Uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, the disgust has been studied experimentally, particularly by Paul Rosen, and, uh, and, and this has inspired uh, a whole lot of further work, uh, not just by psychologists, but also by lawyers. Because it was ultimately the lawyers who were ahead of us uh, in um, analyzing the negative emotions. And this comes from the practical aspects of law. Um, lawyers have to deal with cases uh, which uh, may involve homicide or theft or something else like that, some serious crime which is motivated by hatred uh, or disgust or fear. Uh, so the negative emotions are uh, bread and butter for lawyers. Uh, and, uh, and, and there's a vast body of case law uh, looking at circumstances under which um, uh, the uh, emotional response is regarded as reasonable. The reasonable man um, is not the same thing as the rational man. Uh, the reasonable man will actually be uh, kind of shocked and disgusted under certain circumstances, whereas the devotee of pure uh, Aristotelian or Platonic rationality won't. Uh, and um, so the lawyers have been the, uh, the great pioneers in terms of the academic study of the emotions. Um, and um, the great book on disgust is this book, uh, oh, I've got it up on the screen. I see you're here. I didn't need to hold up my copy. The Anatomy of Disgust by William Ian Miller. There he is on the, le on the left in the picture. Uh, and I'll just read out to you a list of what he regards as the contrast uh, between uh, things which are um, uh, a, 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 a disgust uh, or disgusting and non-disgusting. He often thinks, he says that in many cases there's a contrast. We, we draw uh, the line somewhere in the middle. Um, uh, for example, plant versus animal. Uh, there are very few plants which are disgusting. Perhaps none, uh, whereas quite a lot of animals are regarded as disgusting, or animal activities are regarded as disgusting. So um, the um, uh, inorganic versus organic, organic regarded as disgusting, inorganic regarded as neutral, plant versus animal, human versus animal. Animals can do things which are uh, uh, kind of intrinsically regarded as disgusting, and animals are often taken as, be, as uh, kind of metaphors or synecdoche for uh, things which are disgusting. Uh, you think of the insult where people are called monkeys or behaving like monkeys. Uh, that animal co uh, comparison uh, is uh, an expression of hatred or contempt, uh, and it's because evidently somebody early on uh, in Western culture found monkeys to be uh, disgusting or some of their behavior to be disgusting. Uh, then uh, there are other contrasts like us versus them, me versus you, the outside of me versus the inside of me, dry versus wet, fluid versus vis viscid, uh, firm versus squishy. Squishy things are often regarded as intrinsically disgusting. Um, rough versus silky. Um, uh, still versus wiggly. Wig worms are horrible because they're wiggly. Um, 
uh, uncurdled versus curdled, um, health versus disease, beauty versus ugliness, up versus down, uh, right versus left, ice cold versus hot, or clammy versus lukewarm, uh, and tight versus loose, uh, and moderation versus surfeit. Um, uh, and one versus many. Uh, one of the things which is horrible about cockroaches is they tend to arrive in, in batches of 10 million. So, um, so, uh, so that's um, uh, William Ian Miller's uh, uh, classification of things which are disgusting. Um, and uh, he's interested, of course, in uh, various aspects of uh, disgust and shame. His other great book is on humiliation. Uh, and of course, often these two go together. Uh, somebody does something uh, which uh, other people regard as disgusting. Uh, they protest, uh, and the person feels humiliated. So uh, disgust and shame often go together, and I'm going to talk about shame tomorrow. But the last person I want to mention um, is a wonderful lady from Chicago. Um, there we are. Martha Nussbaum, um, who's a philosopher who teaches in the law school at the University of Chicago. Uh, she, I think, was originally trained as a classicist, but then kind of wandered into philosophy and has been involved in all sorts of things. Uh, and her great book is called Hiding from Humanity, Disgust, Shame, and the Law. Uh, and she's interested in <coughs> a whole lot of the moral and philosophical issues which arise out of um, shame and disgust, particularly in the legal context. So let me just read you again um, a paragraph or two paragraphs from this book. Uh, it's a wonderful book, strongly recommended. It's on the, li on the list. Um, a California judge orders a man convicted of larceny to wear a shirt saying, I am on felony probation for theft. In Florida, convicted drunk drivers are required to display bumper stickers reading convicted DUI, uh, driving under the influence. Um, similar stickers have been authorized in other states, including Texas and Iowa. Penalties like this involving public shaming of the offender are becoming increasingly common as alternatives to fines and imprisonment. Part of this punitive culture which has been developing in America where people kind of feel that um, uh, prison is too good for some criminals. You must find something worse. Um, and here are some other uh, examples. Uh, Jamie Berube was born with Down syndrome. As a result of changes enacted under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, he has an individualized education plan that provides for him to be mainstreamed in a regular public school classroom, albeit with a monitor uh, often sitting by his side. The teacher and monitor work together to ensure that Jamie need not live as a shamed and stigmatized person, and his condition need no longer be the uh, object of humiliation. Uh, Steve, uh, and then another case, Stephen Carr, a drifter uh, uh, lurking in the woods outside the Appalachian Trail, saw two lesbian women making love uh, in their campsite. Uh, he shot them. Uh, killing uh, one uh, outright and seriously wounding the other. Uh, at the trial, charged with first-degree murder, he argued for mitigation to manslaughter on the grounds that his disgust at their lesbian lovemaking had produced a reaction of such overwhelming force and revulsion uh, that uh, he was unable uh, to resist committing the crime. Um, in, uh, I may say that this uh, particular uh, defense was not accepted by the judge, uh, who took the view, uh, very correctly in my view, uh, that um, if he was shocked and disgusted, uh, as a reasonable person, he should have run away, uh, rather than um, have gotten out his rifle. Um, now, 
There are some other uh, uh, important cases which I'll just mention because we will come back to them in later lectures. In a 1973 opinion which still defines the law of obscenity, Chief Justice Warren Burger wrote that obs the obscene must be defined in a manner that includes reference to the disgust and revulsion that the works in question would inspire in the average person applying contemporary community standards. Uh, to make the connection to disgust even clearer, Justice Berger added a learned footnote about the etymology um, of the term obscene, saying it comes from the Latin coinum, filth, uh, and cited dictionary definitions defining obscenity in terms of disgust uh, and uh, of uh, uh, the response uh, to um, uh, uh, excrement. Um, uh, there are similar things, of course, with regard to pornography. Pornography was originally uh, drawings of prostitutes. Pornos is a prostitute in Greek. Uh, so, uh, pornography and obscenity, these are things which uh, inspire disgust and are still subject uh, to uh, legal penalties of various kinds in various parts of the world. So, disgust... Uh, well, it may seem a, a kind of uh, peripheral uh, thing, um, uh, a peculiar kind of weakness of humans uh, that they um, uh, get upset at uh, seeing uh, other people naked or seeing other people's feet if they're in, T in Tahiti. Uh, but um, it has ramifications and uh, has uh, all sorts of links with other kinds of emotions and values. And we'll see that in the next few lectures. Okay, that's enough for today. Um, uh, I will, as usual, be ready to have, uh, uh, have some discussion and, uh, and questions afterwards, but I know there are people who need to leave promptly, so I'm going to sit down for a moment and allow everybody uh, who needs to leave uh, to uh, clear out before we have uh, the discussion.